an elderly couple driving down the road. The wife said, you remember when we were dating? He chuckles a little to himself and says, barely. Yeah, I remember when we were dating. She says, you remember you'd hold my hand and we'd go down the road together and we'd talk and we'd smile and we'd plan. Hmm, yeah. And you remember how you'd, you'd put your arm around me and I'd just snuggle up next to you and down the road we'd go. Two lovebirds in, in love. Hmm, yep. Why don't we do that anymore? He said, I never moved. Things change in relationships. Throw a little wood on the fire, the fire won't go out. It's that time of year. It's, it, it, yeah, there are some expectations, but what a wonderful reminder to show love to the 90-year-old mama that lives across the state or someone that's close at hand or someone in your classroom in the giving of Valentines and the sharing of chocolates or whatever you do. Just take the time to say what you're feeling, particularly as it has to do with love, and put energy into your relationship. It's that time of year. Today's sermon is entitled, The Power of Love. And I take it from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. If you come to my wedding, you might hear this read. Who knows? I haven't been told by the boss. But that's one of those chapters that we read around marriage time. And so it's appropriate to read part of it today as well. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I repeat, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Boys and girls, it's children's time if you're headed in that direction. We're getting ready for another vote. There's always a vote coming down the road. And if you turn on television, you'll see this group and that group. And if you look underneath whatever they happen to be discussing at the time, you usually find that there, somebody is after power. We find that in, in our marriages as well. Somebody wants to be the boss. Somebody wants to make the last decision. I have a friend that told me the secret to always getting the last word. Men, you need to write this down. You can always get the last word in a confrontation with your spouse if you will remember these words. Ready? Yes, dear. There you go. You get the last word right there. Power. Power. We like power. We're enthralled by power. We're impressed by storms. We keep up with hailstorms by which ball they, that it looks like. How strong the wind was, whether it was straight line winds. I think all winds pretty much are straight, aren't they? But we talk about straight line winds. We're into power. When I was a, a young boy, 
I couldn't wait to turn 16 because I'm going to get a big powerful car and I'm going to go down the road and I'm going to have fun. And this is what I envisioned when I went to the Dodge dealership. That's what I wanted right there. That's what I was looking at. Uh, I was looking at that right there. And my first car was a Corolla, a Toyota Corolla. And the paint, had, it had been repainted and it hadn't been repainted real well. And as you went down the road, there were flakes on the top that would lift up like a certain person's haircut in a breeze. You go down the road and it would wave white painted people until it finally broke off. Going down the road about one o'clock at night coming back from a radio uh, station where I was working and something terrible happened and the battery went out and we rolled over. I rolled over something and we were dead in the water. My battery had fallen out of the car. I had rolled over the thing. It was dead to the world and I needed a new car. Still thinking, still thinking. That's what I need right there. That's what I need. What I could afford was that right there. It was yellow vinyl on the inside. The vinyl was already cracking. Mine had a black vinyl top and it, had, it was peeling off. There was rust underneath. It went down the road a little bit like one of those crabs on the ocean because it had been wrecked a few years before. Nobody told me that when I bought it. It still had some Bondo on the front left quarter panel. Probably had something to do with why the car went sideways down the road. And my Sunday school teacher from high school said, Dan, I know it doesn't look like much, but I will not sell you that Roadrunner. That car right there is what you need. It's got a 318 V8. It's going to be running when you wish it would stop. That Roadrunner is not half the car of that Dodge Dart and that's the only car on my lot I will sell you. You buy that car or go someplace else where somebody doesn't love you. And I fell for that. And I bought that car. And you know what? I'm in seminary praying the thing will die. It's uglier now than it was when I bought the thing. It's blowing blue smoke out of the, out of the exhaust pipe. But it still would go anywhere I want to go at 70 miles an hour. Now, the back end sat a little low. Had something to do with leaf springs. But the thing would not die. And so when I'd go to see Smokey and the Bandit, I'd go out to this ugly Dodge car that kind of looked like the headlights are headed toward heaven, peeling and falling apart. And I'd peel out as I left the theater like all the other young bucks of my day, because in my mind, I'm driving that. But in reality, I'm driving that. And I had, I, there, there were a lot of things I could say about that car that wouldn't be appropriate, but one thing is a fact. If you would go out on a date with me driving a worn out one of those, I knew you weren't in it uh, just to look good. I knew you had some interest in me, because there we go. Years later, I got a brand new Dodge. And it was UK blue, and it had cloth interior. Nobody told me the thing didn't have enough energy to get up a hill. So I'd load up my family years later. One of those Mitsubishi powered Dodge Lancers. And you, you get into trouble and you floor it. And you're, the engine would go. And nothing would change on the speedometer. Finally, after all these years, I finally have my Hemi. <laughs> and I know it's just a white Dodge truck. But it's the first Hemi, I've ever had, and I'm having a ball in my truck. Matter of fact, you'll see me in the truck most of the time because if I'm not driving the truck, I'm driving a Prius, you know? And, and that's just not enough power. This week I've been making myself drive the Prius because I haven't driven in a while. But as soon as I get that battery charged, I'm parking it and I'm going back to the Hemi because we're into power. We just are. We're enthralled by that. We go to rock concerts and we kind of like it sitting down front when the bass player's speaker can part our hair and our, and our big belled Levi's flapping the breeze from the, the sound pressure level. We like power. I used to live very near the Ohio River and these barges would go up and down the river all day long. And I asked somebody that worked on the river, how do you make any money with that? It's barely moving downstream and going upstream. Isn't it going slower? How, how do you make any money moving these big barges so slowly? And he said, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, a lot of people say that to me. He said, when you see one of those big barges, you're looking at 180 semi truck loads of coal going up and down the river. And instead of 180 truck drivers 
and their insurance. You've got a small team of people on that. You've got a cook. They sleep on there. They cook on there. They work on there. That's going slow 24-7. It never stops to rest. That's the cheapest way to move coal from one part of the country to the other. There just aren't enough rivers. So we have to use trucks too. And now when I see them, I just imagine how much coal is underneath the water and how powerful that tugboat must be to go around the curves of the Ohio River upstream against the current without crashing at midnight in the middle of the night. That's impressive. Now that's some power right there. Have you ever been to Florida? Gone through Huntsville, Alabama? <laughs> a few years ago, many years ago, the girls were little. Everybody fell asleep, including my wife, who was going to keep me awake on the trip. And I'm going south, and I got almost to the visitor center in hunting, at Huntsville. And she woke up, looked out the window, and saw us going right for that Saturn rocket. She had a come apart. There's a rocket in the road! There's a rocket in the road! If you've ever been down there, it looks like you're going to fly right into it. And you go off to the side and come back, and there's an exit ramp. You can go and you can see it. The 1960s rocket that could lift ton after ton after ton of weight straight up in the air from the blast that came out underneath it. Mighty impressive to a little boy. Mighty impressive. We like power. As powerful as a rocket is, as powerful as a roadrunner might be, as powerful as the Camaro you probably had, <laughs> or whatever cool car or truck you had, when I'm driving that Corolla, as powerful as all those things are, greater still, our scripture says, is the power of love. We usually think of love as being something tender. And there are times when love is tender. But there are times when love is tough. God calls love tough. Love bears all things. The word for bears, not, not the bears in the woods, but the holding up of heavy things. Love bears all things. If you're going to go through breast cancer with somebody, you better love them. You better love them because it's on your shoulders 24-7 till further notice. And, and the things that you used to get out of this marriage, you no longer get that anymore. You don't even get your clothes washed. In fact, you're now the clothes washer till further notice. You better love that person who has a heart attack. You better love that person who, who is in an accident and can't work. And now you have to go to work. And it's so unfair because you're still raising the children and he can't do what he used to. Love bears all things. Love is tough. Love is powerful. Love never fails. Love gives us the power to endure times of crisis. I am praying. I was praying last night as I dropped off to sleep and praying again this morning. Lord, give Mike Armstrong some relief. Give Tony some relief because it's so hard. Eight weeks, chronic pain, can't sleep, neither one of them. And it's all on her shoulders and he's going through all of that pain. And they're doing it because love is tough. Love is tough. Bears all things. Love gives, gives us the power to endure times of crisis. No rest, little nourishment, stresses and strains. And yet, we bear the load. We like to think of women as the fairer sex, gender, whatever word you want me to use right there. But I've seen a woman's job, and I don't know that I could do it. I don't know that I could carry a child in my body and whoosh it out, and then as soon as you put the baby in my arms, forget about all the pain I just went through. But I've seen that happen over and over again. You put that newborn baby in that woman's arms, and the pain is completely forgotten, and she's grinning and smiling. There's still sweat on her brow. 
but the pain is gone and here's my child. It's amazing. Good thing we dudes don't have the babies. It'd be a very small population in this world. Man, love is tough. The power of love. Now, I want to be honest with you. There were a lot of other pictures I could have used right here. But you don't want to see those. You want to see this one. Because sometimes life just gets hard, doesn't it? Sometimes the little baby's in the incubator, and you can see the veins and the arteries and the hoses are going in the nose. Those pictures are out there. You don't want to see those pictures. And beside the incubator, there's a mother smiling, looking down at this little child that's fighting for its life because she's in love with this little child. Love. Love bears all things. But the scripture says, love believes all things. And you know, love is blind until you get married. Love is blind while you're dating. Love is, love is blind. You don't see the flaws. And, and grandparents can't see that their grandchild is a juvenile delinquent and and is it isn't the best student in the world you know my grandmother thought we were all perfect and she would tell people in front of us how perfect we were it was embarrassing how my grandmother couldn't see my flaws and how some of our parents can't see flaws you ready for this love is blind The person he fell in love with doesn't even exist. That guy's not quite as cute as the young buck thinks she would be. Love is blind. A parent's love is kind of like that too. Sometimes parents can be critical. They have to correct, yada, yada, yada. But I tell you what, you tell a parent that their kid is a little less, a little slower than something else. You go to one of these ball games and watch some mom or dad that had never been to church very much talk about their kids. You'd think that was a little Einstein running around. You'd think he could play basketball better than anybody, though he hadn't hit a shot the whole season. To hear mom and dad talk, that child is precious. Love is blind. It sees the best. It sees the hope. And the best, of course, is a grandparent's love. They don't have to straighten you out. Grandparents know what the rules are, and then they break it. And they look into the face of their kids and grin. What you gonna do? I'm grandpa. You get grace from your grandparents. Now, I used to have to sleep with my grandmother. And when she would come to bed, she would start telling the Lord all about me and praying for the day. And she could make me weep talking about me. It was like it wasn't even me she was praying about, but she kept calling me by name. And you know what? My, my grandmother telling God how wonderful I was and praying for me, it broke my heart. I had a potty mouth. I wasn't trying that hard in school. The acne had already come, but to hear grandma talking to Jesus, I'm Burt Reynolds or Burt Lancaster or Burt and Ernie or something. I was perfect. Grandmothers will spoil your blind, just spoil you to death, and so will grandpa. It's a wonderful thing. Grandparents believe all things. I know he hadn't gotten a C all year, but there's an A in that boy. I just know it. Come over here. Here, have some sugar. Yeah, now pull my finger. No, don't, don't go there. Grandparents, they just, they just have undying faith. It's like they're blind to flaws. Scripture says, love believes all things. Look at that precious little girl. Look at the pride in that grandpa's face as he's looking into the eyes of that little girl. Love believes all things. How about this? When a doctor is convinced the patient is gone, but they just won't give up. About 10 years ago, 
in southern New York State. A man went to church on Easter Sunday morning. He went to the early service. He was headed toward his car. He got almost to his car. He passed out, had a massive heart attack, and was rushed to the hospital. His name is Ed. And there he is with his loving wife, wife Blanca. And the doctors worked on him and worked on him and worked on him and there was no pulse. And on Easter Sunday morning, Ed has died. And the doctors were getting ready to pull the plug when a nurse that was in the emergency room that goes to the cha same church with Ed says, this is my friend Ed, you can't give up. You can't give up. And they massaged on his heart for an hour and a half, two hours, and his heart started beating again. He woke up in the hospital a few days later. He had no idea what was going on. He kind of gets lightheaded in, at the church. He wakes up in a hospital bed. He has no idea what's going on. New York State is buzzing. The New York papers are saying, man resurrected on Easter Sunday. Like that news wasn't always tr already true before Ed was resurrected. Well, Ed's still alive today. You might meet him in July because he's a buddy of Vivian's and he's gone into the ministry and so is his son. God's love is powerful. And so is Ed's love for God. He rearranged his whole life to say thanks to God. And that man is a powerful force in New York because love believes all things, the power of love. Well, I'm doing a few more of these stories than usual, but I just gotta share this story. Neil is an elderly man that lives in my hometown, highly decorated man from, from Vietnam and Korea era, retired, he has a wife that is sickly, and a farm right on the edge of the Kentucky-Tennessee border, and his farm is down in the bottomland. Absolutely no cell service anywhere near Neil. And he's down in the bottomland with a tractor, and something happened. The tractor flipped on him. He fell off the tractor face down into the mud. The tractor rolled on top of him. Squeezing, squeezing, breaking, breaking. He's one of those guys that improvises and makes the best of a situation. He started trying to make room to breathe with this tractor pushing down on him. And after about an hour of excruciating pain, trying to get, trying to just be able to breathe, trying not to let this tractor fall any lower, trying to survive because his wife is sick. She needs me to survive. And he realized there's a phone in his pocket and he knows it won't work, but that's the only option he's got. And he managed to get it out and turned it on and he had a bar. Everybody that lives around the Amos community says that's the biggest miracle of the day. It had a bar, he called 911 and eventually after three, no, four hours, they found him out there and started the painstaking task of taking an upside down tractor off of him without killing him and rushed him to Vanderbilt Hospital. I headed to Vanderbilt, I was out there at Amos, but I wasn't anywhere near where he was. I go to Vanderbilt Hospital, they cleaned him up, he was in a sad shape. When I got ready to leave, I reached out to shake his hand and that's when I realized there wasn't a fingernail on either hand. He had dug a hole to stay alive and did something I don't think I could do. And he's alive to tell the story. And I said, Neil, how did you do this? He said, my wife needs me. Neil's wife died about a year ago. And that's him at the last Veterans Day in Scottsville, Kentucky. And after all Neil's been through and the death of his wife, his fingernails grew back, he still got a smile on his face because love is powerful. And his wife needed him. Love gives us hope. Scripture says love endures all things. It's tough. It bears all things. It believes in the unseen. It hopes all things, it endures all 
things. Love is powerful. Love has the ability to turn your enemy into your friend. But you got to be friendly to somebody who's not friendly to you. That's the catch. But you've got a mentor in this because Jesus did that for us. Several times people were throwing rocks at him and trying to throw him off of cliffs and various things. He never once stopped loving them and he won over them in the end. Love is powerful. Some of you might have some turbulence in your marriages or your kids might be driving you crazy and you think, I can't do this. Yes, you can because love is powerful. This is a week where we celebrate that God has given within you the ability to do all things. And the secret is this. You got to love everybody. And then the impossible becomes possible. To survive under a tractor, to come back after an hour and a half in an emergency room when the lines are all being pulled and now you go into the ministry. The ability to raise a wayward child or to be patient with a spouse that's not what they advertised they were. To be faithful in a church where there are problems there's always problems in church. The secret is love. The secret is love. Love is something we feel. But it's also something we are to show. And when you show that love, you transform the world. How can I do that? He did it. And he lives in you. The power of love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your love transformed us. Hallelujah. So many of us, we weren't walking towards you. Some of us were running away, but your love broke through in our life. And now we're living for you because first you died for us. Your love was more powerful than our sin. Thanks be to God. Some of us need to be reminded of that because there is sinning going on around us or maybe there's sinning going on within us and we need to be reminded that God's love in us is more powerful than sin. Our future is more powerful than our past. You believe in us, for you're our heavenly Father, and love is sometimes blind. You see what we can be with you, and you never give up on us. May that be true for us as well. Reveal to us the power of your love. Amen.